Hey everybody, welcome to this week's stream. I hope everybody's doing great today. So, uh, last week we cast some 3D print blanks, uh, the wavy file. Here are the results. I gotta kinda keep them separated. So, look at that, oh man. These are gonna be pretty wicked, I think. A lot of people love these on Instagram. I think I'm probably gonna have to make more because <laughs> These are cool, and I only have... So these are going to the subscription box, folks. Uh, and we made 10. The problem is I'm going to have to burn two of them today uh, to make a custom pen. So <laughs> there are only two uh, that are going to be available. I forgot to get pictures and get these things listed, so they'll be up on the website next week. Uh, but these are the two that are going to be up there. So pretty cool. Now... Uh, we had, uh, well, I had a question on Instagram uh, asking whether it was Magnolia Penworks. Mag I'm not sure who it was, but <laughs> anyway, uh, they asked if I was going to sleeve the, the blank. Uh, I wasn't really exactly certain what, what he meant. Um, I think the question was, are, are you able to just turn one of these blanks, you know, the normal way that we do it, um, not having a tube? inside like you know like for, for custom pens and i i think it's going to be fine um i don't think it's going to be a problem um i've actually already i was <laughs> i was very excited to see how this worked um i really kind of expected the the resin to be um you know just fine with tapping and threading turning i guess could be a little bit more shaky maybe uh, i don't know with the resin 3D printing, I really don't, I, I haven't once seen uh, uh, like a bonding issue between the Illumilite and the 3D print. Uh, and it's it's pretty close in like hardness and everything. Um, it, it's got very similar characteristics to Illumilite when it's fully cured and cast and when you're turning it. Um, it's It polishes well, turns well, so I really don't think that there's gonna be any problems. Um, so I just wanted to kind of mention that, but I actually already made a section. Uh, I was just kind of like, I got to see what's going on with this stuff. So um, I know it kind of took a little bit of the, <laughs> the, the fun away maybe for today because we already know that it's probably going to work, uh, at least for the tapping and threading and drilling and all that kind of stuff. But this thing went smooth. Um, so we've got a section um, and the section's kind of a pain. Uh, out of all the components, that one kind of ends up taking the longest because you got to constantly keep switching drill bits out and stuff. But I mean, e even still, they don't really even take that long. So uh, today, let's see, where are my, these are not my blanks. Let me go get the blanks that we got for today that we are going to be turning um, over here somewhere. Here we go. So I've already, like I said, I had to use two blanks because there just isn't enough in one, one blank. Um, <clears throat> so I've got everything kind of laid out on these. This is gonna be the body. This is how I'm gonna lay everything out. It was kind of tough because there was a lot of things going on. Um, I, I don't, I'm gonna maybe try to align the, the wavy lines, um, but I, it was kind of tough to, to figure out exactly which way I wanted you, you know like the blanks to go how i wanted the colors so i figured this was close enough we'll just go like this um should be pretty cool though so anyway that's what we got now one thing to note uh about um you know these blanks in particular uh typically my you know my most of my blanks the round ones are cast in these you know uh Gatling like the silicone molds and these use a three-quarter inch um, You know actual three-quarter inch um, You know hole, let's say and PVC pipe Comes out to be I forget exactly what it is, but it, it's larger than three-quarter inch um, To fit that so if you're gonna be buying blanks that were cast if you know that were cast in a PVC pipe uh, for your call it chuck you're going to need, I would recommend if you can find one, get a 13 uh, call it, because um, a three quarter is not gonna work. Um, three quarters too small and, and your, your blank is not gonna fit in there. So um, that's one little weird hang up uh, when, when you're dealing with, um, you know, the custom pen making stuff. 
you really need to know what the, the material diameter is, or what I would recommend is just, just make sure that you're covered, get a set, a full set of uh, you know, your collets. A lot of the sets only have like, you know, quarter inch, half inch, like that kind of, um, you know, type of thing, like three quarter inch, maybe up to an inch. I, I think that the ER32s only go up to like, I'm trying to think of if I remember right, they only go up to a certain diameter, but I know you can get a 13 16. So you can also get like a 19 20. I don't understand exactly why they don't just call it a 20 millimeter or whatever, but um, mine say like 19 20 uh, millimeters. And so literally I have like all of them. Um, I just don't like, I, I, I like to get the best fit possible. Um, I don't think that's really totally necessary in, in most cases, but just be aware of that. If you're if you're buying blanks from somebody that's casting in a PVC pipe, you're gonna need to probably, I would just say, go find a 13 16 uh, call it. And I'm trying to remember, I, you can find them on Amazon, I believe, but you might have to go somewhere like uh, Little Machine Shop is maybe where I got mine. Um, I don't remember offhand, but there are places that you can find them. Uh, you may not get one, uh, like a 13 16 in a set. I just wanna let everybody know that. If you're getting into this stuff, there are, <laughs> that's one of the kind of silly things. Um, but you really do need to get a, a, a you know, a call it Chuck. Yeah, you know, it's weird, CJ. I, I have a 19, I think it's a 19 uh, millimeter, and this didn't fit in it for some reason. <laughs> so glad I had a 13 16 um, <clears throat> which I think is a little bit bigger than 19. I don't know offhand though. All right, so, <coughs> excuse me, I'm okay. Uh, I think we are ready to get going. So like I said, I already did the section. Get a drink real quick. Uh, but we're just gonna, um, today we're probably only gonna get around to um, doing the, the you know drilling and tapping and all that kind of stuff on the body and the cap and then next week we'll we'll turn it up and see how it goes but it should be kind of fun i'm excited let's see who's here kim's here but can't make it that's cool and mike McEwen, how was the trip so you were in uh you were down at the um the woodworking shows i think um you'll have to let us know how that went and jennifer's here i'm doing pretty good today a little tired i don't know I think I'm kind of burning the candle at both ends. I'm doing physical therapy and it we've we've it went from like I was just like, oh, you know, stretch and do like, you know, a few few things a few times a week. I guess daily, but it, it didn't take that long to where like I'm like it's kind of like gym type, you know, type stuff. I'm doing deadlifts and all kinds of stuff. So I'm doing that twice a week plus I'm supposed to be doing three more. I would say relatively heavy. Um, it's not that many things. It's just, it's kind of, you know, the more things you have to do per week, uh, a lot of things going on. <laughs> this physical therapy stuff is taking a lot of time for me. Uh, but anyway, I'm doing pretty good. I, the, the good news is the, my leg is progressing. Uh, my legs are a lot stronger already. So like, you know, if, if you're having any like knee pain or whatever kind of pains, I really recommend, you know, go, go check out physical therapy because they, they'll, they'll get you back to where you're not like struggling. That's, you know, that's hopefully, I mean, not, not in every case, but you know, if you've got something that's just kind of bugging you, a lot of times it, it has to do with like a, a weakness or an imbalance in your muscles. Um, and I know that I had an injury, but I mean that the injury was probably caused by an, a weakness or imbalance in uh, my hips, hip muscles, leg muscles. So definitely go and have that checked out. All right, so we got Marks here and Jeans here, nice. Mike Doyle, how's it going? Old Man River, Tony Atkins. DJ's here, of course, and Steve. Tim Costello, nice, Paul. Lots of people here, that's cool. All right. 25 hour travel day, ugh, that's horrible. You get a max of 21 millimeters. Okay, yeah. They, they only go up to so high, and then you have to get like an ER-40. I want something like that. Like there's like a different thing, which those don't fit. I don't, I'm pretty sure that those don't fit in an ER-32 chuck, which is what, uh, you know, what you're going to probably get if you, you know, go to Turner's Warehouse or whatever. That's the, the ER-32 is the most common for this kind of thing. So <clears throat> anyway, and Homerlex is here. Nice. All right, so let's, uh, let's, 
switch over to the, that's not the right camera. This one. Let's go over there. We're going to start with the body first. Doesn't really matter necessarily which one. <clears throat> now I just need to make sure that I put this in the correct way. We're going to be drilling into this side. <clears throat> it's always good to kind of mark things out. Um, I, <laughs> on my, uh, I made a pen out of my tequila sunrise blank, uh, which those will be dropping. Uh, Turner's Warehouse has these right now. Um, I'm going to be dropping these fairly soon. But so the the you know it's like it looks like kind of like a tequila sunrise, um, and I'm kind of bummed because I I drilled my um, I drilled I think it was the yeah it must have been the the body backwards. I was drilling like it should be this way because there's some yellow, and it was supposed to go like that. And I drilled the wrong side. So make sure that you, uh, you know, you're marking things out and you're not just assuming that you got everything oriented properly. Diagrams are always everybody's best friend. All right, so we got that there. First thing we're gonna do is square this up. It's been a while since I've done a custom pen. I've been kind of, I don't know, over the holidays, I didn't do as much stuff with like making stuff. Uh, you know, we had lots of things going on. <clears throat> so I was just kind of keeping up with inventory and doing kind of whatever. Um, so, but I got my, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pan up real quick. I'll show you. <laughs> I should just leave these things up here. I got my cheat sheets on my, uh, my light arm. So I still have to do that. It's, I'm going to have to do that for a while. I think, um, it's just good. It's easy to forget uh like a stupid silly step you know especially if you're not doing like you know daily doing this daily or something like that um it's hard to remember every single step at least for me for sure i gotta find my what is happening here new channel there we go i gotta find my there we go we got the chat up now uh, okay. What else we got here? What? I think I missed a few things. Yeah. Called getting old. Yeah. Well, no. I just. The problem is, I you know most of the pens that I make are kind of like this in between. I don't come to the shop and I'm like, I'm going to make pens today and I'm totally focused on it. I'm just kind of doing a couple things here and there in between making blanks and trying to get stuff done. And so I end up just rushing sometimes, you know, but so we're going to square this up. This is just a regular square. Let's get it nice and flat. good enough and then we're going to move over to our center drill poke a hole in it real quick luckily i i have made enough of these where uh, you know i haven't done this for a while but uh, i'm used to it the the only thing that i'm a little disappointed with it, it's just so much easier for me to do this on my my wood lathe but i do have access to a pretty nice metal lathe but it's kind of a different set of steps a little bit, you know? And the problem is that lathe is not in my shop and it's just really, I, I know it sounds kind of silly. It's just across the shop, but there's not very good lighting over there. I, I just have everything set up, you know, on my wood lathe and it's just, it's really not that hard to do on a wood lathe anyway. But there are a few things that I really would love to be able to use that metal lathe for um i would gain a little bit of accuracy on certain things and all that you know all right so next thing we got to do is go for a six millimeter hole so we can get the the tenon cutter set up and we're going to go in about th three inches deep which is pretty much the length i think of this drill bit um, i have a kind of a this is one of the drill holes that chips just get clogged up and i don't know i i had some 
Uh, what did I have? I had Viking six millimeter drills. And the, you were just constantly like, you could take like maybe like a quarter inch and then back out. And, you, and you're just constantly in and out. And I, I went and found, this is a Gehring, I think. Gehring, Gehring brand. Um, and it's a parabolic drill bit. And so the flutes, you can see the fluting is way different and it just clears chips so much better, especially on this small diameter. Problem is this thing was not cheap and it took me forever. I had to go look around all over the place. One thing that I don't love about this is it's a fairly long drill bit for like a six millimeter. I, I just, I couldn't find something that had fluting the same kind of length, but it's all right, especially if you use a center drill to kind of get things going. What can happen on these is they're they're they can bend a little bit. They they they're more they're not as stiff as a regular drill bit. Um, but so far, I haven't had any issues, and they definitely clear chips like no other. So let me oh I gotta measure this thing. Did I hit the camera? Yeah. So we're pretty much going all just about all the way in. Let me I'm gonna mark this drill bit real quick. I've got plenty of room, I think, but I don't need to drill deeper than I have to anyway. Where is my Sharpie? There it is. There we go. All right, let's see here. Let me scroll back up. Ricardo from Portugal, that's cool. Welcome to the stream. Oh, actually, Paul, so Paul, I think it was you that said that um, your son uses a hay gears, he's a dentist. Uh, let, me, let me know if that's correct. I had a question, I was wondering if you could maybe ask him what, how, how does a dentist office deal with the alcohol waste, you know, like not waste, but like cleaning it or, or I guess, you know, disposing of it with 3D printing. Um, I'm guessing that they probably just have somebody come and pick it up and then just put fresh in there. But I'm just kind of curious if they have any better, better options, you know. Um, I guess I could give you guys a little bit of an update on the Told you I was trying to create like a filter system and that's gone all right. Um, the tough thing is, so with the filters that I've bought, so I, I, if you want to go back and, you know, we, we kind of talked at length about 3D printing last time. I got to move this camera. It's like right in my face. Hold on a minute. We're going to put you guys on the back side of the, hold on. Dizzy cam. I think this is going to work a little bit better overall for everything. If I just do this. Might be a better angle anyway. I'm gonna go look and see how that looks. Seems like a pretty good angle, huh? Ooh, that's nice. Um, anyway, so we, we talked at length about 3D printing stuff, um, <clears throat> but and I, and I shared a link to, to the videos that I have got, you know, where, where I learned about this, like, filtration system thing. Start slow. Look at this. It just cranks out those ribbons. Now I am going to back it out. You can use, um, you know, like WD-40 or uh, mineral oil or whatever to... to and I'll lubricate that. I also find that I don't really need to sometimes with these with this drill bit because it just digs digs in there. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, so I linked to those videos where I got the idea from for that filter system. Um, and so the filters that they use, what I've found is they don't filter the dyes. Um, and I did kind of torture test. <laughs> 
they they both uh, in in their video or at least one of them in their video kind of suggested that you don't start out with like totally demolished like totally you know caked um uh you know alcohol <laughs> caked with uh you know dye and all kinds of junk in it uncured resin and i did that just i wanted to kind of see you know like <clears throat> is this thing going to clear up a bucket of you know used up alcohol <clears throat> and it really didn't do anything with the dyes um, it was still pretty pretty much black now i don't know if i would just if i were to just keep keep it running for like you know four hours <laughs> will it will it fix it i kind of have a feeling that would not work so what I did was I bought some charcoal, activated charcoal filters for that system. And uh, we're gonna see if that, because I, I actually was reading some comments on one of those videos. Um, supposedly that might maybe help. I don't know, a lot of this stuff, especially if it hasn't really been tested in exactly the manner that you want to use it, you gotta just sit there and kind of test things. So we'll have to see, like I said, if this, turns into like a miracle cure for the alcohol issue, you know, washing your prints. It, and this would work for water as well. Um, if it works, then I will let you guys know. But so far, I'm not sure that it's necessarily worth it for most people. Uh, at, at least with the, the filters, the, nor the kind of standard filters. All right, next one, we're gonna make a tenon. Let's see here, is that right? Yeah, tenon cutter. Um, 0.21 inches deep. So for anybody that doesn't know or is new, I think the tenon cutter is probably one of the most um, useful tools in this process, if you're using a wood lathe especially. Um, so Jim Hines, you know, came up with this idea. You got a cutter. This thing, the reason I drilled that six millimeter hole is so that this rod can, can follow along you know keep it uh, in line and then you you basically just set the offset so what we're doing is we're going to create a tenon for the body um, and i got a pen that i can kind of show you that um tequila sunrise pen again so what we're making got to make a tenon first for these, the body threads that, you know, the, the cap threads onto. Um, and I found when I first got into this stuff that the tenons were just, it's not that they're, I don't know that the word hard, they're not difficult to make necessarily. They're just extremely time consuming because if you're doing it just by, with calipers and taking a little bit off, it's hard to get it totally perpendicular with, with uh, hand tools. Or at least let's say it's easy to kind of have it off on like kind of a slope or something. Um, so that tenon cutter takes away the problem of it being perpendicular or I guess, I don't know, parallel in line, you know, with the center of the pen. And it just makes things, and it's, it's just so easy. You just set it, forget it, move on. You don't have to worry about the depth, you know, because that, that, that tenon has to be pretty accurate so that your threads work properly. And you're, you're just sitting there constantly, you take off a little bit and then you're like, calipers and then <laughs> and then oh i went too far that's always what i what happened to me so to set this up we're going to be making we're going to be putting 14 millimeter uh threads let me find my 14 so the way this system works you get these little bushings and these are kind of like your pen kit bushings um, but all it's doing is giving you the offset distance uh, for the cutter so that it creates the perfect size, perfect diameter tenon. So it's pretty, pretty snazzy. This thing is great. Um, is it as accurate as a metal lathe? No, you know, but is it way more accurate than me trying to do it by hand? Absolutely. And it also takes about two seconds compared to like, I mean, I would sit there for like 30 minutes making a tenon. <laughs> it's just, it's not my strong suit, you know? So you just want it to, to fit, but not be too snug for that, that uh, distance there. And then I'm going to go in 0.21. Um, I, don't, I don't need a long body cap 
or you know like cat body these threads do not need to be like half an inch long they just need to be a little bit so your cap you know goes on i mean i could probably even make them shorter than 0.21 they don't even need to be near a quarter inch so i might actually go a little bit shorter on the on these ones um, what i'm trying to do is i you know there's you want enough threads to where it's you know the cap secure on the body um, but not so many that people are sitting there i already got a you know you got a triple lead thread going on and this would be even worse with a single lead um, how many twists does it take because even for me you know if i'm uh, it's not like i sell a lot of these pens i've sold a few but many of them are either going to my friends and family or they're mine and i don't want to be sitting there for three hours um taking my cap off you know <laughs> oh that's not what i want to do I, first i need to measure First, I need to measure. So I'm going to take my calipers out here. We're going to go 0.21, and I'm terrible. I, I go back and forth between inches and millimeters, all over the <laughs> all over the place on these things. I'm going to go a little bit shorter on this one. I'm going to go 0.2. Uh, let me let me measure that one. Hold on a minute. That one might have been a little bit deeper. No. That's fine. Okay, like I was saying, I'm still kind of figuring out what I like. I'm just gonna go 0.2 on this. And then some people may not agree with this, but I'm just gonna use these calipers to, to make a mark. Um, if you have super expensive calipers, I don't know that I'd recommend doing that. These were not cheap, but they're not expensive. And I don't really think it's, for what I use them for, I think it's fine. Okay, I'm just going to get this kind of lined up. I'm going to bring my dust collector in. I'm going to make sure that you guys can see. Yeah, you can still see, I think. Well, let me go look at my big monitor. Uh, that's not a particularly awesome view. Let's get you guys kind of up and above over the action here. It's also kind of fun to watch this thing work. glares and things going on there we go how about that in the action huh go back and double check the big monitor oh yeah there we go okay um i like to pull it, put my dust collector on uh, because it just pulls all those chips right out of out of the way so i can see um, what's going on it's not necessary but it definitely does kind of help otherwise you got to kind of start and stop <clears throat> and uh, one thing also about this I like to just kind of use like I like to go smooth if you're like juddering in there this thing can be a little bit aggressive but if you can kind of just ease in start the cut and then just kind of give it a continuous slow lead you know movement then it, it works really well and I'm going to go about 12, 1100, 1200 RPMs. I don't know. You could probably make arguments for just about any speed. I'm going to grab a hold of my, uh, you know, so that this thing doesn't really twist. Like I said, we're just going to kind of ease it up. If you go too quick at the beginning, it can kind of grab and you're in for some trouble. So I just like to like I said ease it in we get a nice smooth cut okay like i said again i don't don't even really need to go 0 0.21 so i think that's all we really need i think it's just fun to use this tool anyway 
You guys feel like that? Like some tools are just like fun to use. <laughs> it's not even like, oh, I need to make this cut. You're like, I want to make this little, like one of the, one of the, another one that kind of falls in that category is hollowing things with the, the number one hollower. Is that right? Number, I always forget the name of that thing. The easy wood tools, the number, it's number one hollower, I think. Um, with a with a negative rate carbide cutter, it's just it's just fun to do that, even if you don't even need to hollow it out. All right, so we got us some threads. Let's or uh, we got a, a tenon, I should say. Next, I'm going to chamfer the edge so that when we go to put the the threading on, um, everything goes smoothly. Uh, and, and our tap, or I should say our die has an easier time of starting. I'm also going to sand the threads just a little bit. Um, that's a tip that I, I got from uh, from Chad. And it works pretty well. So like I said, we're just going to come in here and just give it a little tap, tap, tap a -roo. That's plenty. That's just to make the, like I said, the, it's just to get the, the tapping started easier. All right, now we're gonna, like I said, 14 millimeters. Is what I, I I typically go with kind of similar dimensions on every for everything. Just kind of keeps things easier. And then I've got the Niels niche, the niche system. This thing is awesome. Also, this is the second tool for if you're doing this on. I would actually say this this would be great on a even on a metal lathe, frankly. Um, definitely on a wood lathe, um, it makes the tapping much easier. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see what, what exactly is happening here with this system. I'm going to have to move the camera. I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so what this is, the system, is a handle. I'm going to back this out. This this pops into your tailstock. This handle can move and spin on that, and it's on the same central axis. I don't know if that's a thing or not, but <laughs> concentric with, with what you just did with your drilling and all that. And then it also has, you know, die and tap holders. Um, and I just pulled out a, a tap version. So this would hold your taps. It would just go in there. And it, it allows you to, this, this would lock down. I don't need to do that though, because we're not doing an inside. Um, it, it allows you to do all the tapping just so easily. It's awesome. All right, so we got our 14 millimeter here. I need to flip this around. That's the wrong size. Is it? Where's my, there it is, okay. I gotta flip this around. I want the, the letters, the, the, the print side. The way these dies work, one side is kind of flat basically, and one side is kind of a, a sloping angle. So it's kind of like a starter side and a finish side. So you're gonna do your first, you're gonna start with the side that has the lettering on it. Because like I said, it's a little bit, the, the, the thread threading in there is tapered just, just slightly. But on the back end, there is none of that taper. And so we're going to start with this first, letters facing out. And I like to try and get this thing kind of centered in this little holder. There. Lock this thing down. First, I want to do a little bit of sanding on this tenon. Um, that kind of reduces the diameter just, just barely slightly, um, but it also makes it a little bit shinier. Um, there's really no way to sand the threads after the fact. So this just kind of gives you a little bit of, a little bit nicer um, finish on that tenon. Just 
using a little bit of 600 here. Just a little bit. And then I'm actually going to move up to 1,000 grit. Just kind of finish with that. Very light pressure when you're doing this. You don't. We're not trying to take any material off, really. We're just trying to polish it up a little bit. All right, so we got that done. Just going to wipe that off a little bit. Okay, let's see here. And cut threads. We're ready. Sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat. Sorry about that. Here, copper owls here. Nice, keep it crafty from the UK. Welcome. Okay, yeah, it was you, Paul. Sorry, I get, I get focused on things and I just lose track of questions and different random things. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see what they do. Like I said, my, my, be, since the even the hobby area doesn't like usually, like, if there's a good solution, even though it's expensive. Like somebody in the hobby kind of crafting community would probably have like seen it. I've never seen anything that processes alcohol like that, like cleans the stuff out of it. Yeah, I know how to do the sun thing and all that. <clears throat> um, what I don't like to do is have to drag buckets of stuff in and out. And like what I want is a filter system <laughs> that just you stick the tubes in it filters it and you move on with your life it does have a uv so I, I don't know if you saw this or if you were here last week but it has uv lights as part of the system so it's all kind of a all-in-one kind of deal yeah the tenon cutter is awesome I'm telling you let's see here's any questions mark setting up a new laser oh man uh, let's see, Mike, uh, have have you and Gretchen left room? I'm not sure about SWAT. The problem is I have so many things going on, uh, taking care of my parents and doing everything else that I'm not sure yet. Um, I would like to go, but I'm not sure if that's going to be a possibility. I am going to Portland. So if you guys are going to the, the AAW in Portland, I've, that's on the calendar. The problem is there's just too many things. I'm going to, you know, Phoenix. Uh, in March, March 23rd, I'm going to be there, um, Portland. I would like to go to a pen show. Um, so we'll just have to kind of see if there's uh, two things. Uh, the other problem is with less time to do, to focus on my business, you know, obviously sales go down. So like, I got to look at my, my income. <laughs> do I have any money to go anywhere? And, uh, and time. So we'll, we'll have to see though. That's a ways away. It's, it's going to be kind of a last minute decision though. Um, let's see here. James is asking, what lathe do I have? Looking for another lathe. Um, I've got the Revo 2436. I've heard great things. There's almost no difference between the 18 and the 24. Um, you know, aside from some heft and, you know, obviously your, your swing and all that kind of stuff. But the 1836 is a great lathe. Everyone that I know that has one loves it. Um, I've loved this one. So yeah, uh, pretty pretty good lathe. Another brand that I that I think is a pretty good one to look at for for this kind of like midsize is the Record Power, and I'm not sure is it the I forget the name of their. There's like the Herald, which is the, I think the small one. Is that right? I don't know. There's like the small one, which that thing's pretty awesome for a smaller lathe. that's pretty capable, and then there's like a bigger one, um, and that's the one that Chad uses on his live streams. Um, that's a great lathe too. I don't know price wise. I haven't really looked at prices. The difference between that and the the Laguna. So, um, but yeah, I think I don't think that you can go wrong. Another one to look at. Um, I've I've had some problems personally, and many people um, have not had issues, especially of, as of late. But um, the Nova. Um, I know Jake's got. I think the Saturn. Is that what it's called? Um, I think he likes his Nova quite a bit. You got Pole Barn. He's got the, the Galaxy. That thing's very similar to the, the 1836. 
Um, and frankly, that's actually what I bought first, but I had nothing but problems with it with two lathes. <laughs> they sent me and I just said, I'm done. You can have your lathes back. Um, so then I switched to Laguna, but it's got some pretty cool advantages. The DVR motor is awesome. Um, I think the fit and finish overall for the Lagunas is, you know, kind of night and day better than the, the Novas typically, at least the, the, the Galaxy. This thing's a lot nicer, this Laguna, like top to bottom. Um, but the DVR motor is awesome. Um, and that's where all of Nova's money goes is into that. And then they kind of shave money off on like, you know, the castings and all that kind of stuff. It's a little bit less quality, I would say, or just, just fine details compared to some of the other ones. Um, but those are, all three of those are pretty good. I mean, I don't know of any lathes that are like, oh, you shouldn't buy that one. You know, it, it's mostly kind of size, price, you know, that kind of thing, typically. Let's see, he worked with a carbon 3D printer. Yeah, but the, uh, the alcohol is just, I, I gotta be honest, like that, the cleaning of the prints, that is the word, that is the downfall with uh, resin printing. But for this application, for, for turning, for, you know, even like threading, drilling, all that kind of stuff, it's just night and day better. Um, you just don't have the same issues that you do with the filament. So it's pretty tough. Yeah, go if you're interested in 3D printing stuff, I really talked a lot about 3D printing stuff. Like, I mean, probably for an hour uh, at the beginning. Um, and res I talked about resin and filament and where what I'm doing and all kinds of different stuff. The filter system that I'm looking at, uh, trying to make. Cardo gonna start turning diamond pens. Nice. Is that like the diamond painting pens uh, that, that people are making? Those things are pretty cool. I actually have one right here. Is that what you mean? Where, where you have like the little tips in them and you pick up the dots and create the pictures. Those are really fun to make. <clears throat> I like those also, especially for um, blanks like this, where you have like glitter, you know, like these are those chunky, these are actually like little Mickey Mouse looking things. Um, those work so much better, um, you know, because you're not drilling a, a hole in, in the middle of it. And so you can really utilize blanks a lot better uh, and clear blanks and stuff like that. Uh, okay, so let's see. Regent, that's nice. Yeah, a lot of people have the Regent. I, I've, I used it. Um, I, I got some time on it uh, when I was down in, in uh, Phoenix last time. <clears throat> Excuse me, last time. And it's, it's a great, uh, you know, Record Power makes really nice lathes. I also did demos on the Herald. Is that the right one? Herald is the small one. Uh, we were demoing at Maker Central that, that first year of Maker Central. I think it was the first year um, when I went, whatever year that was. Um, and it, I, I enjoyed it. It was a great little lathe. No, oh, Nebula. Okay, that's right. Right, yeah, the Rikons. I mean, you know, like everybody's like, I got this one. It's great. I haven't really, uh, I can't think of a lathe offhand and this is just some wd-40 i'm just gonna get the threads or the get a little lubrication on there some cutting fluid let's get this going here let's get you guys up in in the action here um i i can't think of one lathe that somebody's like man that is the worst now you know harbor freight uh, you know that's just that's a consideration of of money um I know a lot of people that even have those ones that are like, you know, it does, it, it does, it works. It's not awesome, but it'll work kind of thing. Um, I think if you got the cash, I would not go that route, but um, you know. All right, so we're just gonna kind of get this started, make sure everything's looking good. It's all running kind of concentric. And then what we're gonna do is just one, two, three, back off. One, two, three, back off. And you don't wanna go too deep. That's, that's far enough once it kind of stops. And we're gonna back it out. And then what we're doing here is we're gonna flip this. <clears throat> just 
and blow the debris out of there. Also off of there. So I'm going to flip my die around, and then we're going to get those, um, you know, the back side. So what, what's happening is on the front side, we've got a taper on the threads, which means that it's really not getting as far back as it would on the other side, where, where there's no taper on the, on the die. <clears throat> uh, where did my... Oh, there it is. So we can go a little, we can get a, like, e eke out a couple more threads on the back side of this. when we flip it around. So it's kind of more like a finishing kind of cut. And if you want, you know, you can wear like gloves. I, honestly, sometimes I do. I don't love having WD-40 all over me. Um, if, you're, if you're dealing, if you're using like some sort of a cutting fluid like that. I said I just I don't I don't I'm guessing that you really kind of want to keep this thing centered is that doesn't feel like it's gauging correctly sometimes it takes a couple tries to get the holes lined up hmm. come on work with me here there we go Like I said, you can tell, uh, I'm as far as I know, all dies come this way. The, the side with the letters, you know, that shows like the, the information, anything that's printed, like, you know, it should probably be, it'll probably be like a laser, like etch or whatever, but anything that has like wording or numbers and stuff, that's gonna be your tapered side. The clear side on the back should be your non-tapered side. I'm going to give this a little spritz here. Some of that stuff is kind of rolled off. Now, I have some problems trying to get this thing started on the back that, with the triple lead. Much easier on the, the smaller ones. You don't want to cross thread it. So may, really take the time to make sure that you've gotten it. Um, You know, gotten those threads lined up because otherwise you're you're just gonna kind of mar them, jack them up, and they're not gonna really work. All right, so let's see. Do I have a cap somewhere that I'm willing to use? I really need to get some little test things because so, I don't really want to have to use a pen that I'm finished with. Hmm. We'll just have to test it later. If you haven't noticed, I'm kind of slow when it comes to doing this stuff. <laughs> Everything looks good, so I think we're good. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to switch to a letter T bit, and we're drilling for the converter. The inside hole. Oh, nice. Tony's going to be in Portland, too. Yeah, the Herald. Turner's Warehouse has them for about 1000 right now, which is a pretty good price. They're trying to kind of, um, from what I understand anyway, I think they're trying to get them kind of in line with like that, the, the smaller Laguna, the Jet, you know, competing with those because it's kind of in the same category. It's kind of, it has some some more capabilities sometimes than some of those. I don't know. That's it's an interesting lathe, like the way that those things are made, um, and, and what it is. It's very simple, but it's very robust at the same time. It's kind of a an interesting design. All right, so we'll switch back to our drill chuck, and all these numbers and letters and all this stuff. Um, there's there's quite a bit of variance. 
and I think some people do my, may do like a, a, a step down. I just go for the T bit and everything works fine. It, that, that works for my, let's see how far does this, there we go. The T bit is gonna work for the threads for the, the section. So for my uh, 10 millimeter, I use the, the, the 10 by one for my, for the section threads. So the T-bit, it's just a one step action that, that just takes care of all this stuff. Um, it, it drills a, a big enough hole for the converter. Uh, do I have a converter? Where's my converters? Hmm. Oh, here it is. So, you know, the ink converter, inkwell thing. That'll fit with the T-bit and I can also do the threading. So I can just do this in one step. Um, like I said, I think some people might do multiple steps and different mess, you know, messing around. I don't know what the point is. I, you can just say you did that and it's a little bit maybe tighter in there, I guess. I don't know. Let me know if anybody does that, this step different. I think I do it a little bit different than I think. I don't know that I've seen anyone else do this, maybe. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if I just came up with it or if uh, if I stole it from someone else put a little bit of WD on there lock it down <clears throat> and then this one we're going in about three inches we need to like I said make room we have to have enough room for this entire converter to fit it is going to, a little bit of it's going to go in the, the section, but we just, that's, you know, that's what we need to make sure fits. And we've already, because we were using the tenon cutter, we've already drilled kind of a, pilot hole. I like to turn the lathe off in between. Some people just kind of shove the tailstock up. Every once in a while it can grab, the drill bit can kind of grab and, and self-feed. So I've just gotten to the point where I just turn the lathe off, push the, the drill bit up, and I don't have that problem. I think if your tailstock is light or slides very, very well, that can be a bigger problem. Also, if you have any play in your quill, that can cause it to kind of grab a little bit. I don't know exactly what, exactly what circumstances cause my setup to do that every once in a while, because it doesn't do it every time. You can usually get away with just kind of shoving the tailstock back up there while the, the blank is turning, but I've had a couple where it catches and I'm and <laughs> you're like, well, I guess it's going to be a four inch hole now. So I just get it to where it kind of bottoms out in that hole, give it a tap back. And I don't have any issues. And I'm always every, every single time I pull back, I'm, I'm re, you know, rewinding the, you know, pulling back the quill. Um, the, the farther the quill has to hang out of the tailstock, the more slop you could have. And with your lathe, you may have a little bit of slop in your quill. I, I, I do, even on this one, um, it's a wood lathe. It's not really made for machining and all that kind of stuff. But you might want to just not, not like tighten, but just move your quill lock to where it just snugs things up so it so that your quill's not moving around that can that can be a big source of increasing the accuracy you know of of all these drill holes and all that kind of stuff because if the thing can kind of flop around chances are you're not drilling the size hole that the drill bit is if there's any room for it to kind of wobble around then you're, you're increasing the diameter of that hole. So everywhere that you can kind of minimize slop, and every lathe is gonna be a little bit different, you're just gonna to have to kind of figure out where, where does yours kind of have a little bit of slop and what ways can you kind of fix it. 
and uh, any, pretty much any wood lathe can can do this kind of stuff. You just got to know the, the like limitations of your lathe and how to kind of help it out. Harold Coronet. Oh, there's Harold Coronet and Regent too. Isn't the isn't the Coronet and the Regent kind of the same thing, but like different like voltage? Hmm. PSI turncraft. Yeah, a lot of people uh, use those. I know, and I mean, they all work. You know, some of them have some little frills and things. Some of them are a little bit better, uh, more like robust, more solid, sturdy, I guess, in a sense. Um, but I mean, like I said, it's the same thing with this. If you know the limitations, generally there's ways to kind of shore up any any problems. Prescott, is it Prescott or Prescott? How do you pronounce that, Prescott? I think it's Prescott, now that I, now that I think about it. All right, so we did our T bit. Let's see here, where are we at? We're gonna chamfer the inside of the hole here real quick. I just use, I have this little chamfering tool. This thing is awesome. I got it on Amazon. Just gives it a little bit of a, little bit of a chamfer. And again, that's to kind of help start the, the 10 millimeter threading, 10 by one. Uh, for the section threads. <clears throat> and I've got that kind of set up on my tap here. We're gonna switch back over to that Neil's niche tool. Get that loaded up. Give it a little squirt. And uh, again, there's, so you could use cutting fluid, I, which I have some of that. My problem is it's super thick and I don't really like it. Um, there's mineral oil worked fine. I, frankly, every, they all, they all work. <laughs> like whatever you wanna use. Um, I would stay away from, uh, some people recommend using like a PAM cooking spray those ty that type of stuff, that stuff can kind of rot and it's gross and sticky. I wouldn't recommend using that. Just go get some mineral oil, that works fine and it's probably cheaper. Alright, and like I said, I was kind of playing around, I wanted to see how, I don't know, I was just kind of anxious, honestly, yesterday. So I've already made a section for this guy, let's see how it fits. Oh man, that is smooth, bam, hey, and I actually kind of lined up the the little waves actually kind of line up. Well, that doesn't happen typically. So I'll even pop in a, a nib so you can kind of see where we're at on this guy. I need to buy, I need to order some new nibs. One thing I don't like, Turner's Warehouse has nibs, but they don't have the silver ones. So that kind of, it's kind of a bummer. So I'm gonna have to order some of those. I like silver typically more than gold, but Anyway, there we have it. We got ourselves a body. And I would recommend, um, this is just a random side note. Um, I like to just have a nib that is over by my lathe and I use this only to test out and make sure that I've, you know, cut the, the threads and everything, everything's working on my section. I don't ever put this thing in a, in a pen because, you know, I'm handling it with nasty fingers. 
the threads are probably full of you know junk and, and mineral or not mineral uh, wd-40 or whatever cutting fluid it's just this is my nib for testing and that's all i use it for um, i would keep your nibs because these things aren't cheap you know i mean these nibs cost like 15 bucks or something like that so just have a nib that especially if you, if you like bent one or something like that use that one for testing and just leave it there just a little kind of a side tip <laughs> you don't want to you don't have to clean them every single time because that's what I would recommend you do if you, are, you know, are using the one that's going with the pen or whatever. Um, I would really recommend cleaning it every single time uh, before you put it in your pen. Just a random side thought. <clears throat> okay, so we are done with the body machining. Time to switch to the cap. Let's see here. Uh, Rhett, what thread size on the nib? So each nib is going to, okay, so I just wanna make sure we're talking about the same things. The nib size, the nib threading um, depends on the nib that you, so this is a Yovo nib. They have a specific um, tap, you know, thread, thread size for, for Yovo. Box gonna have something different. Um, I'm going to look this up for you and see. So this is, again, this is for the Yovo uh, number six. And I'm... Uh, I don't have fives or anything. I don't know. There might even be a different size. Does anybody know if Yovo is for five is different than six? Either way, all I do know for sure is this is a Yovo 6, and this thread is an M7 4.5. Super fine. I mean, you probably can't even see the threads. They're so fine. Um, but that's very specific. So every nib, you got to make sure that you're, you know, you know what your, what nib are you going to be using, or that your customer wants. And if you are someone that's going to offer different sizes, make sure you've got you know or, or different brands and all that stuff make sure that you have the right one now um if you're talking about for the oh let's see i just dropped my nib that's that's why i keep that one at the lathe and don't use it if you're talking about the section threads back here that's an m10 by one uh, you know out you know both both of those things for, for the section itself to to thread into the body um, but for the nib that's an m7 4.5 for yovo six num number six and then the other thing that I also like to, to just rec you know, make sure that you think about is you really want to clean these parts before you go to assemble. Um, and really, it's, it's a good idea to clean them now, um, clean them out before you go to the turning step, which this is actually something else that you might want to get in the habit of, of doing, I, I usually do. Make sure that your mandrel, you know, it's real great that my, my section fits, but if this thing didn't go fit onto my mandrel properly, then we got problems, right? <laughs> when we go to turn it. And this thing's a little bit tight. And I, I have a feeling that it's probably because I've got some junk down in there, um, whether it be in the threads or, or wherever. Um, best thing to do is throw these parts in a, a, a ultrasonic cleaner I, I honestly it's the best way to do to clean these things you just drop it in there for like three minutes walk away and it cleans the things like no other um, and they're ready to be you know and definitely do that before you go to it like assemble the pen and all that stuff uh, after you've done you know after you're done turning it um, but it's not bad i i find because i mean i'm i got 90 psi here that i'm blowing in there Nothing seems to be coming out. Um, I even have a pipe cleaner, you know, and that pulled a few little debris pieces out. But the problem is that these little threads, they don't go to the, the end, the tip. And so it's funny because I'll, I'll think this thing is totally clean. Sometimes even if you just tap it on your lathe, a bunch of junk will fall out, but then I'll throw it in the sonic cleaner and even more stuff comes out. And I'm just like, so, it's always a good idea to clean everything up, um, even really before you turn it, because if it's super tight when you're putting your mandrels on, because there's junk in there, that could kind of not be awesome, uh, let's just say. 
All right, so we got our cap. I've marked this. This is where the body meets, so it's going to go in like that. We're going to be drilling our holes uh, on that side. Get that thing tightened up. And, you know, I usually just hand tighten my collet chuck. This is, uh, you know, for somebody that's new to this, um, you know, you can, you can use the wrench and do all that stuff. I usually don't find it's necessary, um, but yours, you know, may be different, so you may have to actually tighten your, your collet chuck every time. Um, typically, like I said, hand tightening works okay for me in most cases. Just wanted to kind of mention that. Um, don't just look at, you know, I'm just hand tightening it, so that's all you have to do. Um, it may depend on the fit of the blank, you know, your chuck itself. I don't know, all kinds of stuff. So use your own discretion on that one. All right, so first step, we got to square this end. And I, again, I'm not an expert at doing this stuff, so I <laughs> just want to let everyone know. I'm still learning as I go. I'm just showing you what I, what I think. Let's see. Press kit, like biscuit. Press kit, okay, cool. Only tourists pronounce it Prescott. Yeah, it's like Oregon <laughs> or Nevada. It's not how you say Nevada. Uh, what's the thread? Okay, so what's the thread size in the nib? Um, uh, the five and the six are different. Yeah, so make sure that you've got the right, you know, tap for your for the nib that you're using. Yeah, and you gum up on you. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, square that end up. Pretty square. I cut that on the table saw. It's all square. Let's just kind of smooth it out a little bit here. Center drill it, get it ready. Get it ready for prime time. The cap goes pretty quick. There's only a couple operations that you have to do. So we'll be wrapping things up fairly quickly here. And I, if anybody cares, um, I, I usually run when I'm drilling, I usually run it around 900. It does matter, um, but you really don't want to be going super fast, you know. But, I mean, anywhere from like 700 or so to 1,000 is probably going to be fine. For what we're doing... Oh, I need the drill bit. Let's see here. So, 25... So, this is going to be a stepped operation. We're going to do a 25 64ths hole. <clears throat> and again, all of these numbers, like depend on the the thread the you know the cap and body threads or cap i guess cap threads mainly um if you're doing a number 12 thread then you know that's going to be different than a 14 so this, these numbers kind of depend on what what you're doing what your what dimensions your your pen is actually going to be and there's also differing some people will go for the wider hole first then the smaller hole, which actually to me makes sense. My only issue is I find that on resin, it kind of works a little bit. I just feel like it works better if you go small to big. Um, I do think the proper way to do it is actually big to small, but, uh, and, and people do it both ways from what I can tell. So I don't know if it really matters that much. All right, so I need to see Next thing we got to look at real quick, and I, I like to double check this. Um, I have numbers and I pretty much make my pens kind of the same sizes, at least for, for now. But I like to measure this and make sure that I'm drilling. This step needs to cover the section in the nib. And then the next one is gonna be drilling for the threads. Uh, you know, the body thread. So, section and nib. I'm just going to measure this, and we need to have a little bit of extra, so like one point. I'm guessing actually from, from the threads. I haven't done this for a while. Yeah, like a like 2.1. Yep. 
So we want to drill in 2.1. Let's just make sure that my marks are around there, kind of. I'm just going to make a new mark because yeah, 2.0. Probably don't even need to go that far, but it ain't really going to hurt anything. Let's just kind of get in there close. I'm just, I'm, I'm putting a Sharpie mark on my drill bit here so that I take it to the right depth. Uh, and this is important because if this is not deep enough, then you can kind of run into some problems. Because <clears throat> your nib is going to crash out in there. Put a little bit of WD on there. Let's see, I think we got, Mark is here, nice. In the chat land. Yeah, precision is pretty good. Sorry, I was just checking the chat. Oh, that's deep enough. Just want to keep your heat down that's that's why we're putting this lubrication on there um, and especially with this you know we do have a 3d print and there's like a bond between that material and the resin like i said the, the resin 3d prints i don't find have bonding issues with the alumilite resin but if you overheat it then we're talking kind of a different story that that's not like oh there's like a bonding issue that's like you're overheating it the materials are going to kind of possibly warp and if anything happens they're probably not like that amount of heat is going to affect the alumilite differently than it's going to affect the 3d print most likely that's where you get kind of warping and peeling back of that 3d print material so you know keep your heat down for sure when it comes to this stuff um, but I don't think that you should really run into any issues um, with resin printed 3D parts, 3D print parts. Much higher chance of that with a, like a PLA, you know, like your filaments. The best one that I found uh, when I was using a filament printer was ABS but it still had drawbacks drilling that stuff was absolutely horrid um it it just it was like the turning was good because it was a little bit softer so you didn't really it wasn't brittle um but the drilling like it, it heated up and it kind of was like spongy in it and it would get kind of stuck in your drill it just it wasn't very fun like this stuff works pretty good um this th the 3d printed material the resin 3d print stuff i feel like i just don't have problems it's it's pretty much like just turning a normal resin blank i mean worst case scenario i feel like it'd be, maybe be like i don't know like turning like a pine cone 
blank or something like that with like the mini pine cones where you really just don't run into problems. Uh, let's see, I gotta pull out the right drill bit. So this one, I'm gonna be using a 33 64 so Again, 14 millimeter threads um, dictate, you know, these, these measurements, these drill bits that I'm using. Not so much the 25 64s necessarily, but um, that's dictated more by your section diameter. I think that first drill bit, I, I, I guess I would, now that I think about it, um, your, your section, whatever the final dimensions of your section, those are going to need to fit into that 2564. So that's where that number is derived from. And then this 3364, so that's the diameter that I want for my cap threads, uh, the 14 millimeter threads when I tap them. And you could use different, there's, uh, I forget, I'm not sure what millimeter size you would use. Is it 14? Could be. No, probably 13 millimeter I, I, is actually what you would use. So you take the, the size minus the pitch or something like that. I'm not sure exactly. Jim Hines had some method of doing it. Offhand, I can't remember how I came up with this, but <laughs> that's why I got cheat sheets, so I don't have to remember. When I, when I do a different size pen, then I'm going to have to come up with some different notes and, and refigure out how to... Actually, I have a chart that kind of tells me also. It's a little bit more for metal, so I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Let's get this guy snugged up. So again, let me just double check my... Uh, my notes here. Drill for threads. 33 64ths. WD in there. Alan, going good. Oh, oh, Alan, what's up, man? Yeah, the board, it's still up at the, you'll see it at the end of the, the stream. What's up, man? Welcome to the stream. What have you been up to? Uh, am I resin... I, yeah, I'm doing I'm doing resin 3D printing. It's but like it, you know, if you want kind of the full breakdown on my thoughts and things, um, check out last week's replay. It's a pain. Um, I, you know, compared to filament style printing, resin printing has a lot of, it's, it's just a messy, you know, situation, let's just say. Um, it's got its drawbacks, let's say. Um, I, filament printing is way easier for random people, you know, just, I want to get into 3D printing. I think that filament is kind of an, a cheaper and easier way to get into it. Um, you can do it in your house. I would not recommend doing resin printing in your house. I don't think... I, I would really kind of put it on the same level as just resin casting. You know, you're not like, oh, let me just do some, you know, Alumilite resin casting in my, you know, bedroom. Um, it's got... There's, you know, the VOCs. You got you got smells and you're dealing with, you know, alcohol and liquids and all this stuff. So it's kind of a messy situation. But it just works so much better for turning, I think, that it's worth it for me. Um, the one thing about resin printing is it's actually, I would say that, like, getting the printer and everything, like, there's not that many settings. You know, for the most part, you're dealing with, with exposure. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing that you're going to, you know, have to do is, is figure out your exposure settings. And that's like one setting compared to, um, you know, filament printers. They get, there's a lot of stuff going on. 
Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of a chamfer here. You can you can probably hear that. There is you can definitely there's a difference between materials, um, but it's not it's just not as bad as the the filaments. Um, the other thing is this one th these were fairly old. They might have been like I find that kind of like if I print something, cure it in the curing station, then cast it right away, and then turn it. I don't think it says. I don't know. I think you're the curing or whatever is a little bit different. It's not as cured, so it's a little softer. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. But uh, you know, turning it, I don't think is going to be a problem or anything. All right. So the next step is. <clears throat> Sorry guys, the hunger meter is going off and I'm, I'm starting to forget what I need to be doing here. You gotta focus for the final, the final push here. Get this thing ready. Okay, so we are doing some 14. This is a, a triple lead thread. Um, And uh, if you need taps, dies, all that kind of stuff, Turner's Warehouse has you covered. I got a link down in the description to all of their kitless slash bespoke, whatever you want to call this, pen making stuff. And they are stocked. They have like everything you need. One stop shopping. It's great. And, and for anybody that's kind of just getting into pens, hasn't really, wasn't looking into this whatsoever like five years ago i mean there you could not just go someplace and get triple lead taps in in you know 11 12 13 14 15 whatever you wanted like you had to go around and, and a lot of these things were bought on like group buys because you had to go to a manufacturer and and things have changed drastically i would say in the last like five years with this uh, kitless pen making stuff. Um, you just, it was much harder to get the tools and things that you needed and the, you just, the, it wasn't available, easily, readily available anywhere, you know, from, from suppliers. All right, so what am I doing? Put a little bit of juice on here. <clears throat> and bring up our tap. Oh, that's what I need to do is tighten our, got to tighten my tap head thing onto my handle. Then we'll be ready to roll. There we go. Okay. It's looking pretty good, concentric, whatever the word is. It's probably, I'm going to test that, see how that, a little bit of D, WD-40 spray. Um, let's test that on our body and see if that's deep enough. Well, one thing that I do need to do. So there's two different ways to deal with this. You need to clear uh, some sort of a, um, You need to have like a clearance um, either on the body threads or in the inside of the cap. Uh, otherwise, the threads kind of bind up. Um, you, you have to have like a little relief. So if you're doing it on the body, um, let me let me show you on the. I don't know if this will be super easy to see or not. So there's a little relief channel on the section threads there. I don't mind that personally because you, you just don't, you don't see that very often. It's just not a big deal for me. I, what I don't like is I don't like putting that, that little relief channel on the body. I just, it's just, I don't like the looks of that. So I, I don't put a relief on the actual body itself. I put the relief in the cap. And so I'm just gonna take a slight, take a little bit of a chamfer on the inside there Um, okay, yeah, our threads are plenty. But so right now there's no relief and it's gonna kind of start binding up at the end. It almost goes on. And I mean, you could probably even get away with it. 
but there's there's going to be like uh, you know there's going to be a gap where you're you're kind of crunching your threads together so like i said different ways to deal with this i'm just going to pull out my detailer and i'm just going to come in here and just take a little bit of material away um, so so that there's no binding basically um, and like i said it's just right at the right at the beginning in here um, frankly another way what another way that i've done this in the past i think this is the simplest method is just to pull out some sort of a tool um, the, the issue that i run into with this detailer is you really got you got to kind of angle it a little bit and otherwise you're running into the the tool so like actually i to be honest a skew chisel is probably even better now that i actually think about this you can get right in there and just take away the material and you're not running into the tool end or you could put your lathe in reverse and come from this side whichever however way you want to do it i kind of like that a lot actually i never thought about that i think we're going to do that um, another what i was going to say is the way that i was doing this i'd like to just take a little chunk out and have it be the same amount every single time like similar to how i would take out the the relief on the body i would take my 16th inch parting tool and then just come in you know a 16th inch or so um, but it'd be nice to just chuck something up in the tailstock and it just takes away some some amount of material but i think we'll just do another little taper and kind of see how it fits but i think this time like i said i'm going to use my my skew chisel. I think that's a pretty decent way of doing it, actually. I need to get a different tool rest. Either way, you got to have some sort of relief somewhere. Otherwise, you're going to get a binding effect. <clears throat> I really think I'm going to turn the lathe on backwards. I'm going to put it in reverse and I'm going to be cutting on the back side of this. I just, it's going to be a lot easier because I can get in there and see it. I don't have to move the camera. If I can get the tool rest to work with me here. There. I'm going to actually back it off a little bit more. So I'm just going to come in and just kind of take a little bit of a cut. This is nice because I can really see how deep am I, am I actually going. Um, the, the problem that I've had, because I've used the, the detailer, but between having to kind of cock it sideways and all that stuff, I just, it's, it's a little bit harder for me with this detailer. I, I guess you could do it. I'm just got to make sure that you're, I don't know. I'm going to try the skew because I haven't tried that before. Some way, you know, if you're going to do this on the inside, you got to figure out how to do it. All right, so I've turned the, again, the lathe is going in reverse. That's why I can cut, uh-oh, battery. What's going on here? Battery cable came out. That's why I can cut on the back side of this thing. Let's try it. <clears throat> and i just like i said i like doing it on the inside of the cap because nobody sees it it's just done you don't have to see some kind of funky you know thing going on and now it, it tightens up now the issue is i do want to try to line up my oh that's pretty dang that's really close I want to line up my the, the wavy lines. And so the way to do that is I'm just going to nibble off a little bit on the end of this cap here. It is almost dead on. And I just, the thing is, I guess I'm hoping, yeah, that'll let me turn it one more, just a little bit more. So I don't know if you can see that, but the, uh, actually it's not really going to line up because the, the blank's kind of going backwards. Didn't think about that. 
I would have needed, okay, so here's something to think about, guys. I didn't, I didn't really, sometimes you just have to do this to, <laughs> to figure out what's going on. So I can line these up and I'm, and I'm gonna try to line these up, but they're, they're ending not in the, the right orientation, right? It's coming down here and also coming down here where it needs to be kind of, so if, if you're gonna put two of these together to do this, um, where you cut your blanks, you're gonna, if you want all this stuff to line up properly, you're gonna have to kind of align it where, you know, and cut these things where with the waves going in the right direction. I didn't really even think about that when I was cutting these things up. So it's not a big deal. It's just not as awesome as it could be, obviously. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to take a little bit of material off the end of the cap and that will let me give it a little bit more rotation because there's less material, you know, like it stops here because the material goes to this end, you know, this, this length. If I take off a little bit more material, I can turn it a little bit further. The other way to do that is you'd have to take some off the shoulder of, of the other, of your body. And I don't want to do that. So that's a hassle. So we're just gonna, and I, I think it's just gonna take a, a, just a little bit for me to get this thing. Like I said, it's still not gonna be perfect, but Oh, let's let's put it on forward. But at least it'll you know it'll look pretty nice. So I'm just gonna take a little bit, see what that did. You don't want to get overly crazy with this. Where's my lines? I didn't do a whole lot. <sighs> oh, perfect. Look at that. Now, I've taken off some of that chamfer and it's starting to get a little sticky uh, when, when I, when I, you know, tighten that up. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a little, just to take a little nibble off the inside again with that skew chisel. It just, I took enough material off. It took some of that chamfer that I created in there off. I think I can actually just turn it like that. And then I'm going to come in and there we go. Okay. So I'm going to hit reverse again. That's why I'm able to take it off the back side. I got to raise my tool rest up. Okay. Gonna take a little bit more off. See how that did. These things are really fun to make, though. I don't, I don't know for anybody that hasn't made one yet. Yep, we got it lined up pretty well. Not perfect. Oh man, it's hard to see. Well, I could probably do this all day trying to line this up and they still really don't entirely line up. So I'm not going to worry too much about how perfect this one is. But overall, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, like I said, the, sometimes lining things up like that, that can be kind of a pain. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind, I've, I've got triple lead. Oh, that's why it was kind of not, not perfect. Only one position is actually going to line up correctly. I forgot about that. So it'll just kind of de depend 
Um, but I think, man, this thing's going to be, <laughs> this has got a lot going on. Now, you know, what, what's on the outside may not be indicative of what's actually kind of on the inside of this thing. I think there's going to be a little bit, because, you know, we, we dropped these into the, the, the tubes and it kind of pushed the resin all around. So all we're seeing is whatever was on the outside of the tube here. You know, I think that the insides of these are going to hold some secrets, <laughs> let's just say. But it's crazy. I mean, there's so much going on with this thing. Uh, another thing that I also want to mention is another way to deal with this. Um, you know, we've got the wavy lines. I think this would be not not a bad one to do where you've got like, you know, the wavy thing going on and then maybe like even a different cap. Um, or you could, you could maybe go for, you know, a matching section and body and then go for like a black cap or something like that or, you know, some other color. I think all that would probably, you know, work fairly well. And then you wouldn't have to worry about trying to line up and, and get, you know, your wave pattern like perfectly aligned um, from cap to body because there is a little bit going on to, to get that to actually happen. Um, it's going to be a little harder than just lining up, even than just lining up some, some swirls, um, you know. But I think in the end... I think it'll look fine. I, I'm not. I'm not particularly worried about that aspect of this. Pretty close. Like it's almost. It almost looks like it should be that way, but I don't know. We'll have to kind of see. So, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? This thing's going to be pretty crazy. I'm now. So the next step is, uh, we're, and we're not going to do that today. But um, next week we'll turn these guys and uh, and see how all that goes. Now, again, I don't really, I don't foresee massive problems turning this. Um, you know, what we don't have, you know, compared to making just a normal kit pen. What we don't have is we we don't have the blank glued onto a, a subsurface, right? However, you know, the way these things work with your mandrels, you're going to have a decent amount of support. It shouldn't really be, you know, moving or anything like that. However, it's just not fully locked down to, you know, glued onto this mandrel, onto a tube or whatever. So we'll have to kind of see there, you know, that may present some challenges. We'll see. I don't feel like it's going to be too crazy. I don't know. Um, I would say, if anything, the section um, probably has a, a relatively high chance of blowing up. That would probably be the worst part. But especially on this, I think you could easily get away with just going with like a black or, or whatever, just kind of a more of a standard solid color for your nib and not worry about it. Um, this would probably be like a good opportunity to put like an ebonite uh, section on. A lot of people like those. So if you can find some ebonite. Oh, that's the problem. I'm going to have to go back and actually, I again, the, the one thing I forgot about is I didn't test the mandrel. And the mandrel threads go way farther in. And I, I didn't uh, like tap this this cap far enough. So I'll do that after after the show. Um, but this is why I really want to start making my own mandrels because, I, again, I don't need, you know, all these threads. Because of this mandrel, i got to put a lot more threading on the inside of the cap. I kind of forgot about that. Um, but overall, I think that this is going to be pretty cool. What do you guys think? <clears throat> Let's see here. So were you guys talking about different stuff? So do you see the board? <laughs> I got it up. It's 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 on the main thing, Alan. Yeah, I'm doing well. Nice. Yeah, it's been a crazy few years, I'll tell you that, but things are for the most part kind of chilling out a little bit.
three days. Uh, you just started uh, for three, like you've only been doing it for three days. Yeah, I've been doing, I've printed, I've 3D printed for a while. Um, and those are my two. I actually have one more. I still haven't gotten the Mars 4 Ultra set up yet. I've been actually having good luck with the Mars 2 Pro. Uh, up until today, I had a like pretty much a full build plate fail. Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's the thing that I, what I, and I, I've been looking at different printers. There's, there's some expensive printers that supposedly have like excellent reliability, but I still, even though they say that there's like no guarantee that you're going to get hundred percent perfect prints every time with any of these things, even if you spend a lot of money, because especially the way I'm doing things a little bit differently than, than what a lot of these printers are, how they're supposed to be used. So let's see here. Cardo, the aluminum. Yeah, aluminum honeycomb and resin has a, that's a not very good bond. Um, the thing is resin needs, it, it, it needs something to grab onto. And so, you know, wood has wood grain in it. And that's why, you know, things like wood, uh, pine cones, anything where the resin can really kind of grab a hold of that material, that's gonna be a really good bond. Uh, you know, metal though, I mean, it's flat, it's smooth, flat, all that kind of stuff. And there's really no good way to create a scratched or, or bumpy surface on aluminum honeycomb on the insides. There's people talk about, you know, uh, etching the aluminum. I, uh, I tried it with a bunch of different etching agents. I actually got worse results. And I, the thing is, I don't know anything about etching. Uh, I just, I don't think it's difficult. You kind of dunk it in some stuff, it eats it away a little bit, and then you stop that reaction from happening. I understand how it works, but I don't have experience doing that. But all, and I, I tried both sides. I tried acids as well as bases, different levels of that stuff, like so different types of things to etch with. And I never got anything that, that improved the bond. Uh, it just, I don't know that, there's nothing that's really good. Now, as long as you're careful, um, you know, with what you're careful at um, turning it, cutting it, doing all that stuff, keeping the heat down, um, it's fine. I, I've, I don't usually have issues turning aluminum honeycomb things. Now, in this case, I don't know that aluminum honeycomb, uh, I think that's probably gonna be tough, at <laughs> bare minimum tough. Um, the one thing that you can do if you're in that situation where you you know if you really wanted to try making one of these types of pens with an aluminum honeycomb blank the only thing that you can do is just continually douse it with really thin ca glue uh, super glue uh you're over in you said you're in portugal not sure 100 percent sure if they if you have access to this but something like it um, this is what I use to, to, if that's the case, if I need to do something like that, the super fast thin from Starbond or something, you can look up the specs and what you want is something that's the same viscosity as this like super, super thin, like water thin, right? Um, and just let it kind of penetrate into any like tiny little micro fractures, any areas where the aluminum honeycomb and the resin have maybe kind of pulled away. So just take a few cuts, <laughs> dump a bunch, I mean, douse it with super glue. That's going to be, you know, your best shot at doing it. I still don't know if it's really going to work. I don't know that it's worth it. There's going to be so much work involved. Now you could 3D print honeycomb. Um, that's actually something that I'm working on. That's actually what I'm 3D printing. Um, that would make it a lot better than aluminum honeycomb if you went with something that was like a 3D printed material or you could go with cardboard. Uh, we did that a few weeks ago. That is gonna be, that'll work no problem. Um, it's just paper basically. So let's see, do I have, where is the... So like packing materials. Oh, here we go. You know, you can, some, some machines and things that you get have this, this packing material in it. Um, so aluminum or, or cardboard honeycomb, um, that would be a good way to do like a honeycomb style thing, I guess. There's also the Nomex 
Um, that stuff works fine and, you, and it's going to be a good bond. But yeah, anything metal with resin, not very awesome for bonding. Yeah, and filaments, uh, it just, the thing is, those things are all made to melt. <laughs> like they melt at a certain temperature and then it lays down, you know, the thing. So like the heat is definitely not the friend of, of like the filament style uh, 3D printing stuff um, because it can, it, it just, it doesn't have a high heat, um, you know, uh, resistance. So, you know, you really have to be careful when you're drilling it out. That causes a lot of heat with all that friction. Uh, you have to be careful sanding even um, and even turning sometimes. You can kind of heat up the, the material. So just be a little bit careful. I mean, I, I, I've made lots of 3D printed blanks using, um, well, ABS anyway. I don't really like, I don't really like typical PLAs. There may be certain um, combinations of like, like something that I haven't tried just off the top of my head is like the, the PLA carbon fiber uh, mixture. I think that would be murder on your tools, but I'm just, for, for example, I've, I haven't tried that specific filament with, you know, for, for pen blanks. Maybe that would work a little bit better, but like PLA itself is super brittle and it's just not particularly fun to turn. Um, it, it doesn't like sand or polish well, uh, I, I don't think, not compared part of the problem is maybe you could sand it and polish it or whatever if if that's all you're sanding but you've got it next to like a super hard material that does polish well um, and it's not brittle so um, that's the tough thing with, with the you know certain filaments I got pretty good results with PETG that seemed to work all right um, ABS was all right but again that one with like the drilling it was it was kind of softer and it would kind of bunch up in the the drill bit um, didn't really do a lot with PLA uh, have turned a few PLA blanks didn't like it um, trying to think if there was anything else I can't think of anything else that, that I've done but I haven't really done that kind of stuff for five or six years probably maybe five years four some I don't know it's been many years there's newer materials that have come out since but I, I you just have to be a little bit more careful let's say when you're using that for this purpose no the handgun um, this was actually this is if anybody's familiar with Firefly the TV series this is Malcolm's gun <laughs> um, this was uh, so uh, there's another YouTube channel punished props and uh, a few years ago they had like they hit a hundred thousand subscribers and they had this build so they do prop you know prop and costume stuff um, and so they did kind of a community build uh, when they hit a hundred thousand and like gave everybody like plans on how to do this so it's actually made out of um, uh, EVA e EV what is that stuff called EV EVA foam whatever the foam stuff like foam mats um, that's literally what this is I mean you can see the texture is actually like the the texture on a foam mat like a standing mat and then I added my own little resin doohickeys and stuff to, to make the, the the gun so it's uh, what are the, oh, what does he call it it's called a uh, there's actually a name for his, what do you call it I haven't seen Firefly for a while I love that series but what does he call his gun anyway that's what it is it's Malcolm's Mal's gun uh, no, I'm not taking my hat off. It's just there's no point in seeing half bald Zach. It's just not really awesome. <clears throat> cool. All right, so I think that's about it, guys. Time for me to go grab some lunch. Um, so next week, we're going to get these things turned. Like I said, I do have a, a little bit of messing around. Frankly, what I need to do is just remove the, the threads. I think I'm just going to fix this mandrel because... This is a problem. I don't need to put 50 yards of threads in my caps, like I was saying. Frankly, I probably put too much. All I need is that much, <laughs> right? That's like, which that's probably like two and a half turns with that tap. So I think what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to chuck this thing up on my lathe, and I'm literally just going to take off half of these threads because I don't need them. They're just in my way. Um, that's the nice thing is making your own mandrels. You can kind of make them 
to fit the way that you want to make your stuff. Um, another thing that kind of a lot, well, what I'll say is a lot of people with their caps, they do steps. Whereas, you know, if you buy this mandrel, this is one of the um, Beaufort, I think, is, is that who makes it? Beaufort? Whatever, the Turner's Warehouse one. Um, you know, this thing's a solid, you don't really need this huge hole throughout your whole cap. Um, the only thing that I really need the largest size of is just to fit my threads for the most part. And then you have to, you know, be cognizant of your, um, uh, uh, you know, the knit, uh, your section. You know, once this gets turned down, um, you have to make sure that that'll fit all the way through. But that's, that's that first drill bit that we used, right? And so basically I gotta cut, so and what, what I, what I wanna say is a lot of people's cap mandrel is actually stepped itself, right? So you only, you only have the, the big, the wider size for the, the threads, you know, for this part then it steps down to, uh, you know, well, not this size, but to, to whatever size you need to get your section to fit and all that stuff. So, you know, really, eventually, I'm gonna make my own mandrels because these don't work the way that I really want them to. So I think I'm actually, I'm gonna alter this, but you, and you can just turn this, you know, you can modify this. I've actually, I actually already turned this part down um, because there just wasn't enough room to get, kind of get in there when I was turning stuff. So I've already actually turned part of this thing down. Next thing, I think I'm just going to remove a good half of these threads because I just don't need them. So anyway, cool. Yeah, Firefly is awesome. It's just disappointing that it was like one season, but it's pretty cool. Oh, you have a, yeah, yeah, it's not a real gun. <laughs> it's just a, just a prop. Uh, I was, I was, I, I learned a lot of stuff from, and, and got some ideas from Punish Props back then. That was many years ago that, that um, I was kind of watching their channel. But I learned a lot of stuff about silicone mold making from them. Um, they've got lots of good tips. I mean, if you're halfway interested in, in prop making and, and doing different types of stuff like that, highly recommend going and check out their channel. Uh, you know, Bob is just, I'm not Bob, but I was thinking of, uh, 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 I like to make stuff. Um, Bill, uh, Bill Duran. Um, he just is awesome. He just, he's really good at explaining stuff. They, they do excellent quality on their videos. So go check them out. Like I said, punished props. I'm actually going to drop a link to them. I was thinking of, sorry, called, I didn't mean to, I wasn't calling him Bob. I was thinking of Bob Claggett from I like to make stuff. Uh, he's he was also I was, I was following him a lot back then too. Um, YouTube, but yeah, and they have like I said, pretty good information on uh, uh, mold silicone mold making for sure. It's obviously more focused on for for like props and stuff, but you can learn a lot of stuff you know from different uses or different. Um, you know, media, let's say, or different use cases uh, that you can use in your shop. Let's see here. Off to, to the shop to pour a faux turtle shell. Nice. That sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's and there's quite a few people. There's even places if you can get the file, um, you can. There's online sources that'll print out um, 3D prints for you and, and ship them to you. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I can't think of the actual names. Not that hard to find them. There's there's quite a few different sources if you just want to. If you can get the file that you want, which I actually I actually sell a honeycomb file on my site too. Um, if it's something that might work for you um i would say that it's you know if you're going to have somebody custom make everything just have them do the uh the design work as well i th it's probably not going to cost you more <laughs> you know much more to have them design it but um that's a link to the all the different 3d files um, and so again those are it's not for physical prints it's for like the the file 
the downloadable file to print honeycomb or this wavy file or or whatever so anyway guys thanks for joining the fun tonight uh like i said we'll finish this thing up next week i might actually i don't know i might turn one of them or some one piece i i'm not 100 percent sure that i can get all three pieces turned next week in time so i may kind of dabble and do a little bit on my own um it might also kind of give me some ideas uh, if, if I run into problems or some, some weird thing, um, that I can actually give you some good information while I'm turning stuff. Uh, but either way, it should be pretty fun to see this thing come together. I can't wait to see what this pen looks like. I think it's going to be pretty crazy. Uh, I'm, if I, if I were, I'm probably not going to like carry these blanks, you know, long term. I do think I might make a batch or two more because I think a lot of people might be interested. It's just, there's so many colors and, and, things that you have to do uh to create every single color that it's just not not awesome to make them necessarily but um if i do sell these things they're definitely i'm, I'm, I'm calling them wild thing because they're wild so we'll see how these things look in pen form next week so anyway guys i hope you have a great rest of the weekend uh go and if you're watching the super bowl have fun if you're doing like a little party watch party or whatever have fun with that uh, but other than that guys i will see you guys next week saturday at noon pacific time and we will turn up a pen so anyway guys again thank you for joining the fun and i'll see you guys on the next stream